Testament reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 13, starting verse 16. Let me give you the uh, context for this. This is uh, Paul's first uh, missionary journey. He and uh, Barnabas are uh, traveling around what is now southern Turkey. And uh, he had stopped in like he normally did at a synagogue. And, um, and after they had read the scriptures, after they read from the Torah, the law, and the prophets, then the leader of the synagogue uh, greeted these visitors from, from uh, Israel and asked if they had any word to say to the congregation. And that's where our passage begins, verse 16. Then Paul stood up, motioned with his hand, and said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. Now for a time of about forty years, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. After that, he gave them judges for about four hundred and fifty years, till Samuel the prophet. And afterward they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for forty years. When he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a savior. Jesus. My message for this morning is a little bit different than my usual <coughs> Sunday morning message because I am um, doing basically the same message that I did at the Sandwich Fair. So I just came back from the Sandwich Fair. When you're at the Sandwich Fair, you don't have notes in front of you, you don't have a pulpit, and it isn't quite the same. Also, at the Sandwich Fair, it's a lot easier for people just to walk out in the middle of your sermon. <laughs> So uh, you try to get their attention, and what, what we did, like Kirk and Nancy Reed, they, uh, they sang some music, some contemporary Christian music, they would sing a song or two, and then I would preach for a little bit, actually tell a story, tell a story, and then they would sing a little, sing a little bit more, and I would tell another story, so I did, told stories, basically, with a little bit of an application at the end of each, each story, and that's basically what I'm going to do uh, today, so this might be a little bit different, a little bit lighter, you might be glad about, you know, but uh, we'll, we will see. I have chosen out of all the stories of, uh, about King David, I've chosen three of the most famous ones. The first one was, it was read for you as part of our Old Testament lesson today. It is about when God chose David to be king of Israel. Now, God had already chosen a king before. God had chosen Saul to be the king. But Saul disobeyed God, went his own way, he didn't really care what God wanted, he wanted to do what he wanted, so God could not use him any longer. So God rejected him as king and told Samuel, who was the uh, spiritual leader, the old wise spiritual you know, patriarch, if you will, of Israel at this time, to anoint a new king. And he told Samuel to go to the town of Bethlehem to the home of a man by the name of Jesse, because God had chosen one of Jesse's sons to be the king. So Samuel traveled to Bethlehem, and Samuel offered a sacrifice there. Now a sacrifice back then was basically an excuse for a feast. You know, it was, a, it was not just a worship service, it was a, it was a big meal. They would offer an animal, a sheep or a goat as a, as a sacrifice, and, and this type of sacrifice they would simply offer a portion of the meat to God, and the rest of it was basically for, our, for the whole family and neighborhood, in this case pretty much this small town, to come together and have a uh, celebration and a, and a, and a big, big meal. And after the meal, Samuel asked Jesse to bring his oldest son, by the name of Eliab, in front of him, and, uh, and he did. And, uh, and Samuel looked at this oldest son, and he looked like a king. He kind of looked the way Saul did. When he chose Saul before, Saul was very tall. He kind of had that royal bearing about him. 
And uh, his tie, Eliab, he says, surely this is the one that God has chosen to be king. But uh, God spoke into Samuel's heart and said, no, I have rejected this one for being king. This is not the one that I have uh, chosen to be king. So, Samuel asked for the next son, the next oldest son. So the next oldest son came before Samuel. And once again, God spoke into Samuel's heart and said, that one is not the king he either. So they uh, went down son after son after son, and uh, none of them uh, were the ones that God had chosen to be, to be king, king of Israel. And so Samuel said, is that it? Have you run out of sons here? Because back then they didn't have the daughters. I know that these days, you know, like, it's like uh, in England now, they changed the rule. So that if, if uh, King William had had a girl, then she would have been queen. But uh, regardless of how many boys, but back then it was not the queen of Israel, it was the king of Israel. So it was only, only, he was only looking at the sons. So he said, do you have any other sons? And he said, I have one more son, but he, he's the youngest, but he's out keeping the flock out in the field. You know, someone had to watch over the sheep while the rest of us were at the party. He's the youngest, so it fell to him to be out, be out there and not come to this feast. So Samuel said, Go get that son and bring him before me. And he did, and he looked at him, and uh, David, it was, this was David, he was young at this time, he was probably a young teen, and uh, he said that he looked ruddy, which basically meant that he was sunburned from being out in the field all the time doing the work, and also talked about his eyes being uh, bright. <coughs> different tra translations of this, but there's something about his eyes that seem to uh, attract, attract people. And God spoke to Samuel in his heart, and he said, this is the one. This is the one that I have chosen to be my people Israel. So Samuel anointed David as king of Israel. Now what does this story have to teach us for today? Well, it teaches us that God calls us to serve him, not because we are the tallest or the biggest or the most charismatic or the best looking or anything, anything like that. I mean, if that was true, you would never call me to be a pastor. A lot of other pastors that I know of as well. It says that God looks at the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, as it says. But God looks at the heart. God looks into your heart and he looks at the, into my heart. God does not judge by the world, the world standards. <clears throat> God is looking for people who are people after his own heart. David is described in our text, the New Testament text, the man after God's own heart. And that's what he is looking for. He's looking for people who are, are looking for him, who are who love him and are willing to serve him wholeheartedly. The second story from the life of David. It is the story of David and Goliath. That's found in the next chapter after Old Testament lesson of the day, in chapter 17. At this point, David is a, a little bit older, probably. He's probably in mid, mid teens, maybe even older teens. He has not uh, ascended to the throne yet, even though he had been anointed king. Saul had not yet died, so he had not ascended to the throne of, of, of Israel. This was a time when uh, Israel was at war with its neighbors, the Philistines. And they had gathered together for battle in a place called the Valley of Elah. So, and it says that on, this was between two hills. On one hill was all of the armies of the people of the Philistines. And on the other hill was the army of the people of, of Israel. And they were about to fight. The interesting thing is basically these are the same groups fighting today. You know, basically the Philistines and the Israelites. I mean, these are descendants of these ancient peoples that, uh, that uh, from 3,000 years ago are still fighting over the, the same land today. Well, they were gathered together for a battle in this valley, Valley of Elah. And it was, a, uh, it was a custom of that time that opposing armies, before they actually engaged in battle, that they would send out their champions. So there would be a single uh, combat fight before the main battle began. And that, that's, whoever won that single combat fight was seen, this would seem to be a sign that 
God or the gods, depending on uh, which, which nation it was, was on your side. And the Philistines sent out this man named Goliath of Gath. And he is called a giant. Now, we, can't, we shouldn't think of... Um, uh, <laughs> we, we should not think of Jack and the Beanstalk fairy tale giants. This is not supernatural giants. You know, this guy was big, but he wasn't supernatural big. Basically, what we should think of here as a, a guy as tall as an NBA player and as big as an NFL lineman. So this guy is big, you know. Plus, he's an experienced soldier. He says he's been fighting since his youth. He was uh, never lost a battle. So this guy, this guy was a ferocious opponent. So he was the Philistine champion. He came down the field, and nobody from the Hebrew army came to came to, to meet him. Because everyone was afraid of him, basically. They figured they were going up against this guy, it was certain death. So Goliath got out there and began to trash talk, basically. How the deal? He was insulted the king, insulted God, insulted everybody, you know, you, you can think of. But they wouldn't take the bait. No one would come forward. This went on for several days. Well, King David was uh, still the shepherd. He was still the lone man in the totem pole. So he was out in the fields keeping watch over the, the flocks, but he got a day off, and his dad uh, sent him out to the battlefield, to the Valley of Elah, to bring a care package, basically, to the soldiers. His three oldest brothers had enlisted, and they were going to be fighting in this battle, so Jesse sent David to, uh, to the battle with a package for, the, for, for his sons, and to come back and tell them how, how, how things were going. So David went there. And he saw what was going on. He saw Goliath out there in the field taunting Israel's God and taunting the king and taunting everybody. And he said, is nobody going to come up against this guy? Is everybody afraid of this guy? And actually, he made everybody all the Hebrews mad at him, you know. They, said they, were, they, were, they didn't like the fact that he was uh, saying things like that about them. Uh, king Saul was, heard about it, called David into his tent. And in the midst of this conversation, that he, he had, that Saul had with David, David volunteers to, uh, to go up against this uh, Philistine champion, Goliath. Uh, Saul basically says, you know, are you sure? I mean, this is suicide. I mean, you're just a kid. You've never had any battle experience at all. This guy has been a, uh, a soldier since, since, since your age and has fought many, many battles. You know, are you sure you want to go in there? He says, yes. Now, I'm stronger and uh, more stronger than, than, than you think I am. He goes on to say that twice in his life, when he was out watching over in his flock, that he um, had fought off a bear and he had fought off a lion with his staff and with his sling. So he says, you know, if I can fight off a bear and a lion and kill them, surely I can kill this Philistine warrior. So Saul says, okay. We'll give you a chance, we get nobody else who's willing to do it. So but he says that it's under one condition, and that is that you uh, wear some armor. I'm not going to send you out there and defense this. So he, they found some armor that fit David, and he's got a coat of mail, and a, and a breastplate, and a helmet, and a sword. And uh, David tried it out, walked around in it, and it, boy, it just, he never had it on, he couldn't hardly move. He says, I can't do this, you know. I can't fight with this. I can't even move around it. So he took it all off and decided he was going to face, face Goliath just with the things he normally had, his normal clothes on, and a staff, a shepherd's staff that he had, and a sling. Now the sling that uh, they used at that time was not the sling shot, you know, that we think of today with a wide wood, you know, with a rubber band or something. This was a, a leather pouch. Uh, with two long leather straps on it, and in this pouch they would put a rock. Now it's not a pebble. Sometimes the story is told and it sounds like a little tiny pebble or something. This is a good sized rock. This is a size like a baseball. You know, so this is something. And if you put that in there and you twirl it around your head and you let go of one of the straps, it will go. I mean, so you think about a baseball uh, sized rock going as fast as any major league pitcher can pitch a ball. That's the weapon. David was good at this. I mean, 
David could hit a rabbit on the run with his sling. He'd been doing it all his life. So, uh, so David went out there uh, and confronted, confronted Goliath. Goliath trudged out there in all his armor. And David just kind of ran out there where he got the right distance uh, away, away from Goliath. And uh, he let loose his sling and he hit Goliath in that one spot where he uh, was not protected by his armor that was right in the middle of his forehead. And it says that it fractured his skull and it knocked him out. It's kind of like a football, the head-on collisions, you know. We would see on TV, they just knock him out, you know, so hard. So it's knocked Goliath out. It didn't kill him, but it knocked him unconscious in concussion. And it says that David went up to him and he took Goliath's own sword and he, he killed Goliath. And uh, that started the battle, and the battle went on, and Israel won the battle. Now, what's the lesson of this story of David and Goliath? David had said, and when he was facing off against Goliath, he said, The battle is the Lord's. I think there's a lesson it is that might does not make right, and the bigger weapons and defenses do not ensure victory. What matters is whether we are on the Lord's side, whether the Lord is fighting for us or against us. And this is true in every area of life. It is most important that we take sides with, with God and not against God. It's important that we have the courage of David and the spiritual strength of David to stand up for God and stand up for the causes of God in this world and in this country. And if we do that, even giants will fall. The third story. In the life of David is an R-rated story. There's a lot of R-rated stories in the scripture. People don't know that. I think they knew that. There's probably a lot more people who read the Bible. Than they know. There's a lot of those. Uh, this one is about David and Bathsheba. Um, Bathsheba was a beautiful woman, I said. She was married to Uriah the Hittite, who was one of the officers and David's, David's army. So they also lived, Uriah and Bathsheba lived in the house right nearby the royal palace. And it says that it was the spring, the time when kings go off to war, and David had sent his army off once again to fight the Philistines, but David didn't go for some reason, didn't say why, he just decided he wasn't going to go off on that, that particular campaign. And one day he was, he was uh, in his palace, he was on his balcony, he looked out and he saw this beautiful woman taking a bath on her roof. Now we have to think for a moment. That's kind of strange. You know, people taking a bath on their, on their roofs. People don't do that today. But uh, you have to kind of imagine, remember what roofs were back then. All the houses back in those times in Israel, even today in Israel, were flat roofs. And people used it as living space. They would put a, a tent up there. They would put an awning up there, and they would take meals up there, they would sit up there. It's kind of like a front porch or a patio. People were up there all the time. So it's not unusual to see someone on a roof. It was unusual to see someone taking a bath on a roof. It would be like taking a bath on your front porch when they were down driving by. You don't do things like that, you know. So which makes me think that uh, David's not the only one at fault here. Something's going on in Bathsheba's mind. Oh, it takes two to tango here. And um, so things, things are going on. Anyway, David sees Bathsheba taking a bath on the roof. He invites her over for dinner. And one thing leads to another. And about, this is why, this is the, the G-rated, not the R-rated version of the story. And uh, about a month later, um, Bathsheba sends word that she's pregnant. And this is David's child. So David has to decide what to do with that. And he's a politician, and like a lot of politicians, he decides to cover it up. You know? Politicians do some pretty stupid things these days. The stupidest thing they ever do is try to cover up their sin after they've already done it. Just admit it. But David was a politician too. And David tried to cover it up. He decided the best thing to do was try to get Uriah back in the picture and make him think it was his baby. So he called Uriah back from the front lines. And, and talked to him and asked him how the battle was going and so forth. And 
and just told him to, told him to go home to his wife, spend the night at home. And uh, that way he thought that, you know, he would think this was his baby. Rye would not do that. He was a, uh, an officer, and he, he knew that his men were out there sleeping on the ground under hard circumstances, and he was not going to uh, enjoy comfort at home when his soldiers were not. So he refused to do that. So uh, David had to come up with a plan B. His plan B was to get rid of Uriah. He thought the best way to do that was to uh, get him killed in battle. To make sure that happened, he sent a message to his general Joab. And he told Joab to put Uriah on the very front line and then have all the other soldiers fall back without telling Uriah about it, and Uriah would be killed. And that's exactly what happened. Uriah died bravely in battle, and so David was therefore free to take Bathsheba as his wife and bring her over into the, into the palace. So David thought it was fixed. He had solved the problem. No one knew what had happened. There would be no scandal at all, which was kind of silly. Does he really think that God didn't know what was going on here? Maybe he could fool people, but he's not going to fool God. And God let that be known. He did that by sending a prophet, a preacher, by the name of Nathan. And Nathan came to David in his throne room one day, uh, saying that he had a, a case that he wanted uh, David to, 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 to judge. But David was known for his, his, his wisdom. And uh, so he told a story. So it's like a story within a story. Uh, Nathan told this story. He said there were two men in one city, a very rich man and a very poor man. A very rich man had many sheep, hundreds of sheep. The very poor man had only one lamb. And this lamb was precious to him. He lived in his house. He played with his children, ate from his table, just a part of the family. The kids, kids, kids loved this, this little lamb. Then one day a traveler came to the city and came to the rich man's house. And it was the uh, obligation in those days that you show hospitality. So this rich man was supposed to slaughter a lamb and have some meat for this traveler. But he didn't want to slaughter one of his hundreds of sheep. So he took the young, he took the, the poor man's lamb, slaughtered that, and served that as the meal. And uh, Nathan says to David, what should happen to this rich man? And David gets very, very upset. And he says, what this man did was wrong. This man should surely die. And uh, Nathan looks David in the eye and points at him and says, You are the man. And in this way, uh, David was convicted of his sin. He realized what he had done. He realized that God knew that what he had done. And to his credit, it says that he confessed his sin, he repented of his sin, and he received forgiveness of God from, from his sin. Now, what does this story tell us today? It tells us that there is no such thing as covering up our sin when it comes to God. No such thing as secret sin. No such thing as hiding anything from God. That everything in our heart and our lives are open to God. And that we, we need to confess our sins. For the scripture says that if we say we don't have sin, we're a liar. The truth is not in us. And if we confess our sins, that He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is an important lesson to remember, that each one of us has fallen short, which is the basic biblical mean, meaning of, of, of the, word, the word sin. And we need to confess that sin. And if we confess that sin, we receive forgiveness of sins through the one that is the sacrifice, the, the one who provides an opening for sin, the forgiveness of sins. That is Jesus Christ, who is often called the Son of David, because he is the descendant of the same King David. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for these stories. So many stories in the Bible, so many interesting stories we tell over and over and over again, and they, they touch us in many different ways. And Lord, these stories touch us. Especially, it helps us to realize that, that you see us as we really are. People might see us from the outside, but you look on the heart. You see the good in us. You see the sin in us. And Lord, if there's one thing we need to do, we need to come to you honestly, 
openly, without hypocrisy, that we must confess our sins to you and realize that no matter what we have done, you will forgive our sins. David was an adulterer and he was a murderer. And yet it also says he was a man after your own heart. Because even when he sinned, even when he fell, he confessed that and received forgiveness. Lord, we have sinned and we have fallen. We confess that. We pray that you might grant us that assurance of forgiveness that we have through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.